Hello, and welcome to the 2022 Harlan Institute Ashbrook Virtual Supreme Court Competition. My name is Josh Blackman, and it's my honor to welcome you to the semifinal round, match number four. Representing the petitioners in this case will be Dak Steinbeck and Aria Hoke, and representing the respondents will be Isabella Becerra and Campbell Clark, and they'll be arguing the case of Students for Fair Admission versus University of North Carolina. We're so happy to have you. Petitioner, whenever you're ready, you may begin. Hello, my name is Dax Tech, and my co-counsel is Aria Hoke. May it please the court. 25 years ago, uh, Chief Justice Senator O'Connor stated in the majority opinion for Greta v. Bollinger that in 25 years time, that the use of racial preferencing, right, racial preferencing will no longer be needed to... Further the interests approved in the case. All right. And we believe that the uh, social conditions found today are no longer or satisfy this uh, case found in Senator O'Connor's uh, brief and that racial preferencing is no longer needed today and thus Greta V. Bollinger should be overruled. The University of North Carolina has created and used an admission system that considers race and ethnicity as part of its admissions process. This is consistent with Greta v. Bollinger, where the Supreme Court of the United States outlined the appropriate method of considering race as a factor in college admissions. Universities may complete a highly individualized review of each applicant and meaningfully consider variables of each applicant along with race that contribute to the compelling state interest of diversity. However, in November of 2014, Students for Fair Admissions filed a lawsuit against the University of North Carolina, alleging that its process of using race as a factor in admissions violates the 14th Amendment along with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They also duly filed the Students for Fair Admission against Harvard case, case which is both being considered by the Supreme Court. Um, SFFA appealed the trial court decision, but then petitioned the Supreme Court of the United States to hear the case without conventional appellate review. The Supreme Court agreed, agreed to hear both of these cases. All right, let me, let me jump in. So before we get to the modern precedent, let's talk a little bit history. Um, this question is for Dak to start. How do you think the history from the 1860s uh, uh, supports your position? Well, as we can find in uh, the 1860s Reconstruction Era Congress establishing the Freedmen Bureau to help the uh, Freedmen's transition more into a life of uh, equality, we can see that the Freedmen Bureau was a temporary remedy to solve this issue. And we can see in Gregory Bollinger, Sandy O'Connor uh, implies that racial preferencing in college admissions is a temporary uh, solution and that it'll have to be phased out in due time. And we believe now is that time that which racial preferencing is no longer needed to get diversity in schools. And we can find diversity in schools and admissions in many different ways, such as looking so at- Let's talk so about the, this for, for Aria. Let's look at the Freedmen's Bureau for a few moments. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a race conscious law, laws that provided benefits to people on the basis of their race? Yes, it was intended to help smoothen the transition from black people from slavery into citizens in society. The Freedmen's Bureau and the Congress at the time there was a lot of debate and it was very hotly contested because some believed that by using the Freedmen's Bureau, it was overextending the limits established in the 14th Amendment. We believe that by using the 14th Amendment not to use as equal footing, but to further that would be overextending its limits and to justify affirmative action by using the 14th Amendment would be antithetical to the purpose of it. But if the frame is the 14th Amendment were okay using racial preferences in the 1860s, why can't the University of North Carolina use racial preferences today? Because at the time and the establishment of the 14th Amendment, Black people were slaves. And then they were so suddenly transitioned into full citizens with the same privileges and immunities as any other citizen. Therefore, the steep jump kind of forced them to use severe measures as like the Freedmen's Bureau in place to educate Black people and teach them their rights. However, nowadays we so see that the there's- position that is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is your yeah. position that racial preferences may have been permitted for a specific purpose in the 1860s, but they're no longer permissible today? Essentially, yes. We're saying that um, at the time, the context around the 14th Amendment is why the use of racial preferencing was so accepted. And now today we should cut back on those limits and we should not base um, how we use the 14th today on the standards of the 1860s in which the position of African-Americans and the disparity in race was so much more different. And we can see in Harvey Bollinger that the conditions to discriminate based on race were satisfied back then. But 
as again, going back to the Senator O'Connor, today, the conditions of racial equality have satisfied the need to no longer need this 14th Amendment strict scrutiny and compelling state interest. It doesn't meet it anymore. And therefore, we should exclude racial based referencing from our admissions. How do we know it's not needed anymore? What are, what are, what are the, what is the uh, proof that it's not needed anymore that affirmed that the, that Greta V. Bollinger has done its job? Well, it's almost been, I think, what, 20 something years, almost 25, but not particularly, um, that we've, since the establishment of Greta. And we've seen major strides in the way that our country has addressed um, racism and systemic racism. I think that the main argument behind keeping race-based admissions is sort of a form of reparations, where we're meant to be addressing systemic racism and the way that it's affected Black people. However, our argument today is that there needs to be an end point. There's no purpose in creating race-based programs if they're meant to continue but has on. It, has it, the, the purpose of Greta V. Bollinger in affirmative action, the compelling state interest is to create diversity in schools. So has it effectively created diversity in schools? And if so, how? What, where's, how do we show that? Well, I think that Greta fulfilled its purpose purpose in creating diversity in schools because it created racial diversity. There was more racial diversity in schools, which we didn't see much of at the time. However, nowadays, we need to be focusing on implementing more factors of um, diversity, such as socioeconomic status. Um, that way, by implementing socioeconomic status as a major form of admissions, we can not only... It or like, or, okay, sorry, I, it was lagging, but... Um, not only can socioeconomic status um, help admit Black people and underrepresented minorities who are less well off, but it can also open up doors and make sure that we're not viewing diversity as just race and not creating the narrative that race inherently guarantees a diverse perspective. And we can see even. Uh, Council Frank asked, what happens if, you know, there's some evidence in the record that schools have tried socioeconomic status for their admissions? and they can't achieve the level of diversity they think that they need. How do you respond to that? Well, I think in like many essays that uh, applicants submit to their essays, they can like include uh, certain like terms or like expressions that can like, can, uh, or like allude to like someone's race or someone's ethnicity, like, oh, my ethnicity or like the way that I was raised, the area that I was raised has given me these conditions that Aren't they just bypass, I mean, isn't that just bypassing the ban on racial preferences if you can just hide it in your essay? Isn't that kind of an avoidance? Well, I think as we can see in like Grutter, um, when, or not in Grutter, but in this case, UNC v. Students for Fair Admission, we can see that like, instead of like including in your essay, you're submitting an optional tick for your race. And that's something that the admissions right, officers- Are you okay with- Students just saying the first sentence of their essay is I'm black and that's the first sentence of their essay. Would you be okay with that? Um, well, personally, I think that our position is that if a student wants to include their race in their essay as it, they see it to be prevalent to their life story, that is all up to them. I mean, we're not regulating the content of personal essays, right? We're just regulating how, we wanna regulate how universities view race. We don't want race to be considered as like this huge factor that's giving people um, more of a leg up in, I guess, this race for admission, but um, that's Doesn't how- that leave doing. room for individual um, college admissions officers to be able to discriminate based on race if they, you know, say, I'm just gonna go off of what they say in their personal essay. That's still, would that be a permissible use of race under y'all's argu argument? Well, actually, this is kind of relevant because in the UNC case, in the petitioner's brief that was submitted by um, SFFA, they included multiple text conversations between admissions officers in UNC where they were almost derogatorily referring to students by their race. Like this brown girl got a 1300 or guessing students based off of their race um, on like their test scores. And it seemed like nowadays with the um, programs that we have in place and the admissions process we already have, that admissions officers are still using race to discriminate against kids. And they're not looking at it holistically like the like the establishment of Greta intended. Let me ask you a question. Oh. Let, 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 let's say after everything we do here, overall Greta, we do what you want us to do. 
and universities simply aren't able to achieve diversity. They have a completely white freshman class. Are you okay with that? I think that it would, by using socioeconomic status, it would almost be impossible to- They, they try and they, they, they'll say they're, they're, they're two black kids in the class instead of zero. They get a couple. Mm -hmm. Most of the people admitted through socioeconomic status are poor white kids. Is that okay? Well, I think if that were the results of um, college admissions for like the year of 2024, if this case were to be over, going to be bullish or were to be overruled and the petitioners were to be granted uh, admission, right? I think that if the class were to be completely white and have no minority students, that would definitely be a problem as that wouldn't be satisfying. Like, and how, but, then, but then maybe the school should be able to consider race, right? Once you say that it's a problem, then schools need to consider race, don't they? Yes, but um, we can see with like uh, in California um, with Prop 209, I believe that um, the the population or of diverse of like racial minority in this. You're over. I'm sorry. I asked you a question over, but just finish your sentence, please. Oh, I didn't realize um, that there was people. The argument behind diversity and scene was that oh, see, we took away. Um, affirmative action and now there's a decrease in minorities however we can see that in the statistics okay, in our thank brief you. hey thank you so much that was my fault i led you over the time i'm sorry all right uh thank you very much uh 15 minutes for respondents whenever you're ready and petition please turn for camera okay when you're ready counselor mr chief justice and may it please the court my name is campbell clark and along with my co-counsel isabella bezerra we represent the respondents Students for Fair Admissions claims that UNC's use of affirmative action in their admissions is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. However, affirmative action has upheld the standard of strict scrutiny as it is a compelling government interest. In the classroom, a diverse setting benefits every student. In Brown v. Board, board it was said that what makes for greatness in a school is the ability of a diverse student body to engage in discussions and exchange views with other students. In addition, the pursuit of affirmative action at the collegiate level leads to stronger performance in professional fields, including businesses and the military, which is why these professions have also seeked interest in pursuing diversity. The trial court considers the extent to which UNC has already engaged in, quote, serious good faith consideration of workable race neutral alternatives, end quote, as stated in Grutter v. Bollinger. Mr. Farmer, UNC's vice provost for enrollment and undergraduate admission says, Quote, the literature review strongly demonstrated that schools like UNC has not found race neutral, neutral alternatives that worked well, end quote. Finally, we have not yet met the equality of opportunity intended in the Freed Freedmen's Bureau, the 14th Amendment, or Grutter. This court must stand firm in its promise of equal opportunity and racial equality by upholding Grutter v. Bollinger. All right, Councilor, so let's, let's talk a bit about precedent, All right, We took that Supreme Court precedent. How do you understand Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy? I'm sorry, may, Your Honor, may you repeat that? I'm sorry, how do you understand Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy? You know, are you familiar with the decision? We're familiar with the decision made in Plessy v. Ferguson. I just do not think we're familiar with Justice Harlan's uh, dissent. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Let's talk about Brown versus Board of Education. I think you, you sort of put a modern day spin on Brown by talking about diversity, but the reason why the school segregation was bad was because the racial classification was unconstitutional. How do you square Brown with racial preferences and affirmative action? Well, the issue when it came to Brown v. Board of Education was that the schools were completely segregated. There was no diversity because there was black schools and there was white schools. There was no in between. So, in um, so when Brown v. Board was overruled, that ended segregation within schools. But sorry, however, you, sorry, did you say Brown was overruled, or do you mean sorry, when, when Brown was decided? Okay. Um, spoke. When Brown was decided, schools, while they were legally um not supposed to be segregated, they contained her main slightly segregated because of um, districting and other problems with integration. And this has carried on to modern day situation. But my point is different. I mean, how, how do you, is Brown consistent with Grutter? How can you use racial classifications to help students 
but not to harm. Why aren't all racial classifications that we banned outright? Well, we believe that the goal in Brown, the goal set in Brown was to integrate schools. And um, that is like consistent how, with the how goal. Did they, and how do they integrate the schools through what means? Um, may I expand, expand on that, please? How, what was the reasoning of the court of why schools must be integrated? What, what was what was what was the Topeka, Kansas public school system doing that was bad? Well, I think it um, came to just the idea of um, inequality. Right, and why was there inequality in the Topeka, Kansas public schools? Well, essentially, it was just that um, that schools that were segregated were just inherently unequal. Because oh, I, know, I know. So, right. Why were the schools segregated? What were they doing that was bad? I mean, what, 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 how are they, how are they separating students? It's, an, it's not a trick question. Yes, they were looking at race and separating them. Yes. Okay. They're looking, they're looking at race. Okay. So now, so go to the present. Why is looking at race bad and brown, but good and gruder? In, in um, Plessy, looking at race, um, it was said that looking at race separated people instead of uniting them. So in affirmative action, um, looking at race instead unites and forms diversity. But aren't some people excluded because of that? Because some races are treated better than other races. Yes, however, it is proven that races that may be quote unquote, discriminate against in affirmative action are at a different standpoint in society than those who tend to benefit from What do you mean are at a different standpoint in society? Can you elaborate, please? Um, well, for example, currently there are examples of Black Americans who are still facing the effects of, um, of slavery. And for example, um, and I know in, North, in a North Carolina public school district, the funds for public schools and charter schools were um, lowered. However, the charter schools, which were predominantly white, later on were so look, doubled. So let's, let's explain it like this, right? When you have admissions to university, there are only so many seats, right? You have, let's say, a thousand seats in the freshman class. If you admit some students because of their race, you're excluding other people because of their race. You can't avoid that simple fact. Well, race in um, UNC's admission process is not a predominant factor. So UNC is not solely looking at race, it's the holistic you know, I want to go to your point before that you said some races are in better position than others. I, I want just to explain what that means. Sure. Um, well, there have been many instances where different races are benefiting more than other races. This is shown in just um, assets. The average white family holds um, more um, about $170,000 in net assets, while the average black family just holds 17,000. So schools can and, schools, so schools can make it harder for white people to get in than black people. That's what they should do. They should they should make the standards harder for white people to get in because they have all this money. I wouldn't it's like we said it's a um, small factor. Race is a small factor. And it's no, also not just about money. There has been other points that inequality was shown in, for example, racial bias in the classroom. Um, it's just overall, it shows that minority students like Black and Hispanics have been disadvantaged in the education system um, throughout history. And that does set them back in the uh, admission. One more, what, what are Asian American students? Have they been disadvantaged throughout American history? Of course, but... Um, our research shows that Asian Americans, while they have been disadvantaged in American history, like in internment camps and other stuff, um, they have not been um, as disadvantaged like minorities in the education system. You say that there are too many Asians in schools now? No, but I'm just saying that they have more resources and they have that advantage in schools. I mean, I'm sorry, but like you think Asians have more resources. They're not poor Asian people who lack resources, who come from first immigrant families, first generation immigrant family. I mean, I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what your point is here. <clears throat> well, there are obviously Asians and whites who are at a, um, economic 
um, who do have economic difficulties and other difficulties in society, as research has shown that is just more prominent amongst um, like the black community as a whole compared to the Asian American community as a whole. All right, let's move on. You can move on with your argument. Of course, um, we would like to point out also the compelling interest of diversity and how that is prominent in this case. Um, overall, diversity reduces bias and stereotypes. It fosters innovations and broadened perspectives in in classes, and that is just. I have a question. Overall. Of course, yes, Your Honor. Um, so the compelling interest you've stated is creating diversity through many different life experiences. Do you think that the means of affirmative action is narrowly tailored enough, meaning that it 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 uh, is not under inclusive? Because if we're only looking at race as a factor instead of uh, socioeconomics or um, those types of things, doesn't it uh, limit the ability to create that diversity of life experiences? Well, affirmative action has been narrowly tailored to the point where um, racial quotas cannot be used. That was decided in Bakke, and that also it cannot necessarily, um, yeah, they, um, it just, race can be a factor, but it cannot be the entire admissions. For example, if you have multiple, if you, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but um, in Backy, in the opinion, it had said that flexible enough to consider all pertinent elements of diversity in light of the particular qualifications of each applicant and to place them on the same footing for consideration, although not necessarily pouring them the same weight. So that is essentially just saying that offer, that race can be um, included in admissions as long as not taking over the, as long as not the ultimate deciding factor in admissions. And that has narrowly tailored affirmative action to a certain extent. Now, Justice O'Connor spoke of the end of our need for affirmative action in college admissions being around 25 years. At what point would we no longer need to use affirmative action? If we're talking about admitting more Black and Hispanic students, is that a particular number? Is What exactly is the end goal? Um, like we have previously stated, we have not reached that end goal. And that end goal would be diversity and equality overall. And but how do you define diversity and equality overall? Mm -hmm. um, well, diversity would just be that idea of everyone, the variety of cultures, ideas, and perspectives. And equality would necessarily be equality in resources to all of all ethnicities, all races, all groups of people. So does your university right now not equal to um, students of every race? UNC, can you, I'm sorry, Your Honor, can you repeat that? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're talking about the end goal being equality for all race. Is your university, do they not treat all students equally? What's the need for this seemingly retroactive use of race in the admissions process? UNC has the goal of diversity and equality, of course. And, but however, it still, we still do need affirmative action to ensure equality. Since we have not reached that point outside in fundamental schooling or just in America overall, overall of equality. So if we were to um, um, overturn Grutter and affirmative action, that would cause backsliding and would, would backslide into. Adding on to that, in Cal in, when California passed Proposition 209, admissions for Black, for Black students and Hispanic students and Native American students all dropped. And while some research has shown that these numbers have, have um, kind of leveled out once again to what they were previous to Proposition 209. That is not plausible for many institutions. For example, UNC has tried other approaches to try and obtain a diverse student body, but that has just not been as effective as the use of affirmative action. We would like to highlight that the idea of diversity is 
that idea of like so needed diversity is really important in higher education in um, creating the future leaders of America. And for example, Justice Sotomayor claims to be quote, product of affirmative action. And um, with lower test, test scores than her classmates, she was able to excel, obviously. And um, test scores? I, I, I know she's, she's spoken about affirmative action. Has she ever actually said she had lower test scores? Excuse me? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did Justice Sotomayor say she had lower test scores than her classmates? I don't think she's ever said that. She graduated with Latin honors at Princeton. Oh, I mean, SAT, like SAT scores in Order, high school. Was she speaking at herself or someone else? I, I just want to make sure I understand what you just said. Herself. Did she say that? She had lower Yes. Okay. Um, and as well with Obama, he claims to be, um, he claims to have um, benefited from affirmative action. And in comparison to Britain, who has no affirmative action, they have not had yet, yet had any prime minister of color or Supreme Court justice of color. It is also important to note that affirmative action at the collegiate level has um, does prepare these students for a future in a diverse workforce. Many um, businesses, a statistic was that 88.4% of employers reported um, having formal diversity recruiting programs at these universities because they want to fulfill a diverse workforce because there's been studies that show that having a diverse um, employee having diverse employees does benefit a company in business. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Okay, uh, we have five minutes now for rebuttal. Okay. Um, as Justice Harlan said in his dissent in Plessy, the constitution is colorblind. Additionally, we believe that the Brown v. Board ruling should not be used to further race conscious um, admissions processes, but rather should be used as an example of race neutral admissions. The idea that um, considering race can inherently create inequality and in a superior group and an inferior group should not be used to support the respondents view that using race and viewing race as a consideration, a major consideration in admissions is antithetical to what Brown v. Board established. If I, if I can interrupt, your friends on the other side, I think, made a fair point, right? They say Brown was about using race to help people, but I'm sorry, Brown was using race to hurt people, but UNC is using race to help people. How do you respond to that argument? Oh, <laughs> um, oh wait, sorry. Could you repeat that one second? Like just one more time, Your Honor. Your friends on the other side said that Brown was using race to hurt people, segregation, but UNC is using race to help people, for of action. One's okay, one's not. H how do you respond to that argument? That Brown was using segregation using to hurt people. classifications to hurt people. Well, I think we can see in affirmative action that certain affirmative action policies, as we can see in Harvard, where personality is a factor certain races are considered by admissions officers as having racial stereotypes. Like in Harvard, we can see that most Asian, Asian American students are seen as having a lesser personality and less potential, like due to racial stereotypes, uh, like fostered by these admissions officers. And we can see that that is a way that affirmative action harms people based on their race. But won't these implicit biases of the college admissions officers exist no matter how they're considered? As long as they can see a person face to face, that will always be a factor, will it not? Well, I think that it's more important about the training of these admissions officers that in UNC's brief that they said that they're, the way of, that they train their admissions officers is to only view race um, as a very small factor. However, we can see that it's very obvious through the text messages that these officers had a lot of bias against people. And not only by eliminating so how, affirmative action. So, so how will eliminating permanent affirmative action prevent them from using that bias as opposed to at least with an affirmative action, we, we can detail exactly how they are using that bias? Well, we believe that um, by making strides to change the way that we uh, see admissions factors, like not just focusing on race, but by eliminating race as an option in um, admissions factors and working to make it more fair and make it more um, 
have factors like socioeconomic status, uh, political ideology, and various other factors that we can work towards eliminating that implicit bias. It's not going to be an instant um, prescription to anti-bias and um, non-discriminatory practices, but that we should be making steps in the right direction rather than continuing to uphold discriminatory practices. And by using uh, affirmative action instead of racial conscious, but by using social economic factors, we can we predict that we will see racial diversity on the campus due to uh, certain races being like socially economically disadvantages due to school funding and teacher quality, right? And currently we can see at Harvard and other high ranking Ivy League colleges that even though they are uh, ethnically and racially diverse, they often all mostly come from very uh, wealthy affluent communities that have the resources to properly educate their students, advise their students and, app and apply to these highly colleges at such a high level that they're at an advantage compared to people that are in lower social economic communities. They may be immigrants, they might not have, uh, their parents may have not gone to college. So by using race-based affirmative action, we're not really solving the diversity problem found at our colleges today. One more point. Um, when we talk about, you know, underrepresented minorities, and I think your friend on the other side make a fair point, how do you deal with the fact that we do have racism in our society today, certain groups are disadvantaged in many regards. What's your answer to how universities should be able to address those apart from socioeconomic? Let's say socioeconomic doesn't work. How do you address mm -hmm. racial inequality? I'd say that we address um, that racial inequality by looking at other factors, not just socioeconomic, but political ideology is one where um, by using political ideology to diversify your campus, you are allowing a variety of opinions to come through and educate people. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the arguments for affirmative action is that to um, fix and, oh, am, I, am I allowed to continue? Finish your sentence, yeah. Okay. That one of the arguments is that it's a form of reparations in order to address um, the economic um, effects of systemic racism. However, we can see that it's obvious that race-based admissions are not actually fixing the economic burden or admitting um, impoverished black people, but rather that wealthy people are still being allowed to um, have a leg up on the competition. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let me turn the camera. Thank you very much. If the other team will be some back on camera. Uh, congratulations, that was not easy. Um, you know, some of these rounds seem to be focusing more on the law stuff and some seem to focus more on policy. And that's just, that, that seems to be based on what arguments bring forward. The policy arguments I think here are very difficult on both sides. And I think your, your, your answer is sort of illustrated the, the, the traps that you can sort of walk into that you should just be sort of aware of. Um, and you were right, Sotomayor did make a comment or SATs. I, I'd forgotten that point, so I wanna make sure that you, you were correct on that point. I, 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 I thought you said about grade, which I think she had said, but ST, you're exactly right. Um, whenever you start saying that some races are better positioned than others to do better in school, you're really walking into a minefield. And I think Isabella and Campbell got caught in that minefield with respect to the Asian students and white students as well. I would not lead off with statistics that white people have more money. Um, it just, it, it sends completely the wrong message. Um, or, or that Asian kids have higher SAT scores. I would just, I, I would avoid that. Uh, I think you did recover and say that the Asian students were, were not discriminated against. Although I think on the other side, they can say that the, uh, there was not racial preference for the Asians, even though they've not exactly been in a position of power in this country for very long. Uh, in fact, they've been oppressed more than, more than most groups ever have. Um, on the other side, um, it's a very tricky question when I come at you full bore and say, would you be okay if there's no minority students in a college class, like you know, one or two black, black students, right? There's not really a good answer to that question. Um, if you listen to the oral argument of the Supreme Court, uh, the lawyer for UNC, I'm sorry, the lawyer for the, the plaintiffs was being grilled by Justice Kagan. And Justice Kagan asked him point blank, would there be any problem if an entering class is all white? And he's like, no constitutional problem at all. And he stuck to that ground. He did not, he did not blink. And everything you've learned in school your entire life tells you that can't be okay, right? You guys are drilled with this stuff. Uh, but sometimes when you're arguing a position, you have to draw a line in the sand and not cross it. So I think for the plaintiffs, a line in the sand is, yeah, I'd be okay if there are no, if, there are no, um, if, if the class is all white, it was, you may not agree with that position, but you still have to draw that line in the sand. 
And then for the respondents, you have to be very careful to focus only on the harms, the underprivileged groups, and don't focus on the benefits of the privileged groups, if that makes sense, right? Because once you start saying, oh, they don't need the privileges, they don't need the preferences, you just walk into a door. So I, I think you, they, both sides have this. And if, if you listen to the Supreme Court argument, you had some very skilled lawyers flailing around like fish. The same way you guys felt like you were kind of just flopping around. Trust me, you were not alone. The actual lawyers arguing this case didn't do, well, they didn't, they didn't, they did not, the lawyer for UNC did not have his best day. The lawyer for Harvard did not have his best day. The lawyer for students for admissions did not have his best day. They all had a very lousy day at the Supreme Court. Um, I want to just make that point. Now, uh, uh, now we'll go to Abby and Daniel, some of their, their comments. So I want to just lead off with those, uh, with those thoughts first. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. I just want to say great job uh, to both teams. Uh, there are some pretty tricky questions that my, 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 I don't know how I would have answered, and I think y'all did great. I think one tip that I could probably give both teams is when a judge asks you a question, make sure the first thing that comes out of your mouth is the answer to the question. So, you know, is is blank permissible? Yes, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Then explain why. But make sure to give that one answer or else they're just going to come back and just keep grilling you and you get caught in this feedback loop, which is not a fun place to be. But great job, guys. Um, yes, everything Daniel said, you guys did great. I love the policy questions. I think you guys handled it really well. I don't know how I would have answered a lot of those questions. There are no good answers. There are no good answers. No, there are no good answers. And so you guys, I mean, you feel like when you're arguing, there is, and there's not. It's just about arguing the policy. You guys did really wonderful. The only tip I can give, um, leading off of what Daniel said, is that when a judge asks a question, and I know because I've done it in my moot court, is to just don't say like I've like I've just said or like I've already said. Just just repeat it because maybe they just didn't hear it and I know it's it's not even being rude it's just trying to start start a sentence but just be sure be cognizant to just say yes or no not like I just said but yeah. you guys did great yeah I'll, I'll just come back and, and if you think my questions are unfair I also don't know how to answer these questions there's not really a good answer what I'm trying to do is to Oh, that's not bad, but make you squirm. That's what I do with my law students sometimes. I want to see how you are under the pressure. Daniel and Abby are nodding their heads. They've been in my classroom. And the purpose is not to cause you discomfort, although that's an effect, but see how you how you handle it when I force you to deviate from your script, when I know you don't have an answer. And if you notice, I'm pushing you where I sense you're weak, and I keep pushing you there because I want to see how you go unprepared. And I think you all did very well on that front. Um, just on the substance, it's, uh, Justice O'Connor, not Chief Justice O'Connor. A couple people said, I think he said Chief Justice O'Connor. Uh, that, that's that's fine. It's a minor thing, but just that, that's a little thing. Um, the the handoffs are always tricky. Um, a couple of times between Ariana and, and Dak, you weren't sure who was going to answer. Um, that's something you can just practice, right? I don't know if you want to just alternate. Um, uh, I think actually Isabella and Campbell, even though you're not in the same location, the handoffs I think were pretty were pretty smooth, which is which which is actually very uh, very good because it doesn't always work well when you're when you're remote over Zoom and you're sitting in Aruba. Is that is that right? I hope you get to the beach after this and and uh, go go enjoy a mocktail or something. Uh, I said mocktail, Aaron. Don't worry. I said mocktail. Um, pushing tra uh, traveling across state lines for moral purposes. Yeah. Um, uh, the the substance was tricky, right? So I think um, I asked the team from Greenwich about Harlan's descent and Plessy. Um, uh, this was the famous, the Constitution's colorblind descent. That's where he wrote about this. Yeah, now I'll come back to you. Uh, but you didn't know it. And, and, and that's, you know, it happens. And when you don't know something, um, don't just look frozen. Just say, you're on enough familiar with that opinion. Don't try and just guess. Because say you're on familiar with the majority opinion. And I think you pivoted to Brown, which is also good. Um, uh, but, but I thought both teams I did well. And, and again, what, the reason why this case is so fascinating is it forces you to talk about race in ways we don't, right? In most universities, you accept diversity as gospel and you, you have to kind of just accept it. That's, that's, that's where there is. And this exercise forces you to probe exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. And you can't just rely on the platitudes you learned in school. You have to actually, on both sides, you have to be willing to countenance what diversity does and what it doesn't do and how you get and how you can't do it. So this is a, I think a very useful case for students as well to, 
sort of reassess how they approach these issues. But both teams did very well. Um, you can ask us questions now if you have anything you want to ask us about law school, about the competition, whatever you want. <clears throat> Well, I was just curious about um, Mr. Blackman, what you're like, are you a law school professor or? Yeah, yes. I teach at the South Texas College of Law in Houston. Uh, if you're ever in Houston, you're welcome to come by and sit in my class. Uh, you guys are in Dallas, not, not too far. My friends connect here a little bit further, uh, but you're always welcome to visit or email me if you have any questions. Always happy to talk. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Good. Anyone interested in law school among the four of you? Mm -hmm. These, Ari, you want to do law school? How about you, Dak? Yeah, I want to do law school for sure because I don't know. It's just sure. very interesting. Why? Do you have any lawyers in your family? No, it's just like well, you know, like a lot of like young girls who are kind of argumentative always get told, "Oh, you should be a lawyer when in the future." But I guess I kind of just latched onto that idea instead of like throwing it away. So I don't know. I just think it's like such an interesting like area that has like so many different like ways that you can incorporate it into your life and your like job. And I think that that's like very tempting to me, so. Well, that, that, that's, I don't know, Abby, what do you think about that? I'll, I'll let you fill that question. <laughs> I was also argumentative young girl and was told a lot that I should go to law school. Here I am. And, and, it is. and there she is. <laughs> and I, and I, I am excelling and it's wonderful. And I do get to argue a lot. And you know, what's really great is that you're not just arguing, you're learning how to argue and how to argue both sides and really look at things mm -hmm. objectively. So yeah. I encourage it. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, I argued a lot as well. Um, uh, what I will say is that for, this is another reason why I like this problem so much is it forces you to do both sides. You really have to take a position that you probably don't agree with, wherever, wherever it is, and say things you don't agree with, and that's a very good skill to use. Okay. Uh, any other questions from my friends in Greenwich or Aruba? Or... <laughs> All right, well then I will kindly ask if the teams could sign off and I will confer with the judges. Well, the results posted later this week. Thank you all so much. <laughs>